photographers. Have you been reading about NFTs and how they're selling for tens and even hundreds of thousands of dollars? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? How do we make money by selling our images as NFTs? Well, I do want to try selling an image using NFT, but after doing a little research, I'm not buying into the promise of the hype of a bright new future where photographers are being well compensated for their work. And I asked if you were interested, and more than a third of those who responded are not. This video is for the other two thirds. As the title says, I am a cynic. And there's lots of satire, sarcasm, and irony ahead. Thanks to Kaufman, we close Saturday. Try the veal. <laughs> NFTs are the initials of non-fungible tokens. And when they're attached to photos, music, art, and other digital assets, they provide a way to transfer ownership of the asset. So, whoa, what is fungible? Why are these non-fungible? The fungible version of NFTs are Ethers. That's the native cryptocurrency of the Ethereum platform. Ethers are similar to Bitcoin, which is the largest cryptocurrency. You can use the Bitcoin cryptocurrency to buy a car, like a Tesla, which costs about one Bitcoin. A cryptocurrency is a digital asset and is used as a medium of exchange. It is an alternate to what the cryptocurrency types call fiat currency. In this case, fiat means government decree, not an Italian car company. Uh, for the moment, if you want to buy a fiat, you'll have to use fiat currency. I know this is confusing. <laughs> the Canadian, American, and Australian dollar, the euro, the British pound, the Thai baht, are all fiat currencies, although we usually just call them money. <laughs> the term fiat currency is a term preferred by the crypto crowd, mainly so the rest of us have a term other than real money. Fiat has a mildly pejorative military dictatorship kind of connotation, but not when you're buying a car. So like fiat, Fungible isn't a new word, it's just been given a new usage by the linguistically creative crypto crowd who are careful with their syntactical choices. Anyway, we're all having fun saying fungible. A non-fungible token is also a currency, but it's like a collectible version of the currency. It's kind of like a stamp. A stamp has a face value and can be used to send a letter. When you do that, the stamp is fungible. All stamps of a specific value are the same and completely interchangeable. But when it's a special stamp, a collectible stamp, maybe it's a unique stamp, it's no longer like other stamps. It has a value that's greater than its fungible value as postage. Now it's less fungible, maybe even non-fungible. I hope that makes sense. A cryptocurrency, like Ether, usually has several characteristics. It is not managed by a central authority the way the Federal Reserve manages the US dollar. The Ethereum system is instead managed by widely dispersed and independent computers called nodes connected to the internet. When a transaction involving Ethereum occurs, a large number of the nodes participate, validating and processing the transaction, or else it fails, making it difficult, hopefully impossible, to pull what my generation calls a fast one. A single entity cannot change the ownership of an ether. All the nodes must agree, the parties, buyer and seller, must both be valid and certified actors in the Ethereum space with access to the passwords and keys required to access the token representing the Ether and to safely transfer its ownership to another. A safe, but not perfect, hackers, particularly when there's money involved, can be endlessly creative and resourceful. Read about forking Ethereum to learn more. Uh, each Ether has a database entry, usually called a ledger, which contains the complete history of that Ether and all of the transactions it has participated in since its creation. That history, that ledger, is or is also called a blockchain. 
every ether is part of one, the programming of the Ethereum system, and the nodes who participate certify that a transaction is valid and is recorded in a secure and unchangeable way. Each transaction adds to the blockchain. Uh, in order to sustain the system, the nodes are operated by miners. Miners are compensated for processing a transaction. Miners earn, or more correctly, mine, ethers. Ethers are somehow created in the processing activity. Incidentally, miners are not generally underage employees, and mining is not a get-rich-quick scheme. But the compensation for processing, usually called gas, is widely distributed with tiny portions going to each node. Buying, selling, and creating NFTs all cost gas. Now, it isn't possible to accurately state what the gas for an Ethereum transaction might be, but from what I've seen recently, $100 US to create an NFT is a reasonable guess. It fluctuates widely based on demand, depending on how much gas you're willing to spend to have your transaction processed now. So $100 is an order of magnitude estimate. That means more than $10 less than $1,000. That is our first red flag, although no penalty is assessed. Ethereum's widely decentralized structure makes the system secure as there are multiple copies of a blockchain which are all verified before a transaction can be made. The only way to determine the ownership or to change the ownership of an Ether is cryptographically. There is no other record, no other medium of exchange, just the blockchain. Well, unlike Ether, Bitcoin's only function is as a cryptocurrency. Ethereum was designed later and differently, and it is not just, or not only, a currency. An Ether, technically an ERC-20, is one of the many forms of Ethereum tokens. The Ethereum system is, at its heart, a contract system, and the ERC-20 is a type of contract, or token, representing a cryptocurrency. Now, there's a whole rabbit hole now where I could explain ERC means Ethereum request for comment, as well as terms like proof of work and proof of stake. And that stake is in post in the ground, not the stuff that vegans avoid. This is a language minefield. We're not going there now. Anyway, the ERC-20 is fungible. Any ERC-20, any Ether, is the exact equal to another, and they can be used interchangeably. Your five Ethers are the exact equal to my five Ethers, and while you can't yet use them to buy a fiat automobile, there are ways to exchange them for fiat currency. The Ethereum system supports multiple variations of tokens and types of contracts. This contract aspect of Ethereum makes it interesting and a value in many types of transactions, as developers can create contract types, ERCs, with a variety of programmable attributes. Now, these contracts are also called dApps or dApps. They're fun, like Crypto Kitties. Read an article about Crypto Kitties or about ICOs, initial coin offerings. Uh, both should quickly cool your interest in NFTs. Uh, Crypto Kitties, based on the ERC721 token, have interesting attributes, including a specific image and parameters related to their breeding habits, as well as the characteristics they could pass to their offspring. The blockchain assures those contractual attributes cannot be changed, and there was a contractual limit. Only 4 billion cats could be mined, uh, bred in total. In the ensuing crush, fortunes worthy of a Nigerian prince were made and lost, while I watched sharks devouring sardines. The ERC-21 was a non-fungible token. One crypto kitty was not like another. Each had a specific image and could breed in a specific manner. Each was a unique entity, and as a result, each had a unique value. And each kitty had a token, a blockchain, which included not just the image, but all of the characteristics, and then subsequently, all of the ownership transfers, the provenance. The token enables the current owner to certify their ownership and the kitty's specific qualities, which they included the ability to breed more kitties. Without a token, your image of a crypto kitty is valueless.
which helps to explain why the token and its attributes are where the value is, not the image associated with the token. And the digital asset associated with the token is usually a URL where the file is actually stored. What happens when that server eventually disappears? Well, after the kitty boom, ERC-721 tokens became known as NFTs. Cool kids say nifties. Non-fungible or unique tokens and lots of other ways were developed using these tokens as an indication of ownership, authenticity, and provenance. At the most basic level, that's what an NFT is, a contract or token signifying your ownership of, uh, well, of the token. That's the only unique or individual part of your NFT. It indicates that you've purchased a token from a vendor. The token may include a link to a digital image, audio, or other file, and may have contractual terms that convey certain privileges or attributes. Kings of Leon are doing interesting things with that. And while their NFTs may include a copy of the song and the right to listen to it, they don't include the rights to sell the recording, to license the music or the lyrics, to broadcast the song, or any other right. If all you want to do is listen to the song, go to Spotify. <laughs> However, as the owner of the NFT, you do have the right to sell the token, including the right to listen to the song, to someone else who may not have heard about Spotify. If you can convince them that it's worth more than you paid for it, well, buy low, sell high, caveat emptor, and all, all that. So when an artist mints an NFT token that relates to or includes a digital asset, their copy of the file, which may or may not be an original file, doesn't leave their computer the way a painting or other singular physical asset leaves an artist's studio. The artist and all the hundreds of others who have downloaded a copy of the image or the song all still have their copy. The digital file attached to the token is not by definition an original, depending on your definition of the word original. Uh, when the artist or seller creates a token with an image, it's just one more copy in circulation on the internet. The only original, individual, or unique part of it is the token. And the token does not signify an exclusive ownership, although the artist or seller may include that as one of the properties of the contract. It's not usual. Nor does ownership of the token of a digital asset necessarily include any copyright or usage right, although, again, these could be included. For example, it's contractually possible to include a royalty payment of a percentage of any future sale back to the original owner, potentially the artist. The token does not include necessarily any exclusivity of minted tokens related to the original digital asset. The artist may continue to mint numerous tokens, including the asset, each no more or less authentic or original except for the token. But these could be terms of the contract included in the ERC-721. Now, an interesting new twist. Some are now selling NFTs with ownership of a portion of another NFT. For example, Martin, not his real name, owns a valuable crypto kitty. He sells 20 NFTs to his friends or others who trust him, each of which represent a 120th share of the original crypto kitty. Oh, sorry, trigger alert. Here, math ahead. But if math makes you uncomfortable, NFTs are definitely not for you. Now, for example, the original Crypto Kitty was worth twenty thousand. Uh, Martin sells ten of the twenty shares for two thousand dollars each, uh, promising that thanks to the breeding potential, the original Kitty will soon be worth fifty thousand, making their shares worth twenty-five hundred dollars. Of course, Martin only has to sell ten shares to repay his initial investment. Now suppose that Martin uses some of that income to purchase back a couple of those shares for twenty-five hundred. Those friends and their friends will undoubtedly be hungry for more action as Martin uses the money from new investors to pay off the previous ones. <sighs> okay, that's enough cynicism for now. 
Or is it? D do we need to point our cynicism at the apparently horrendous amount of electrical energy and the resulting environmental impact of running nodes and mining? Well, maybe, but not until after we figure out how much energy a bank or the credit card processing systems use, or all the server farms required to power our collective Google searches or Amazon shopping. Let's keep the energy usage of the NFTs in perspective, at least until we're all driving electric cars. Or not, as they also use large amounts of electricity. Uh, that's if we can, of course, even buy a car. The huge demand for the processing chips used in mining operations has created a global chip shortage. Car plants have had to slow their assembly lines, and now you can't even find a notebook computer. But let's not blame NFTs for our climate crisis, or think that green NFTs can solve it either. Uh, where does this leave the majority of photographers who are creating images for an undefined buyer? In about the same place as a taxi driver before Uber arrived, or an artist before Fiverr, or a musician wondering if direct sales of MP3s might sustain them. There is hope, but little chance of reward. What reward there might be will quickly be co-opted by ruthless disruptors and well-funded startups. Now, clearly, this development has no impact on wedding photographers or anyone else doing bespoke work for their clients. NFTs will not make finding clients easier or simplify your business relationships. An NFT doesn't provide more leverage over sales to or through a stock image marketplace even if the contract includes a residual payment. In fact, the existence of gas adds an unnecessary and costly intermediary. Give me PayPal. I actually can't think of any advantage that this new marketplace and this new sales mechanism offers, either to the buyer or to the seller, except for the mostly abstract value of the token itself. Now, many of the advantages that I read about are illusions created by the always hopeful Pollyannas, who don't seem to understand human nature. Now, it's easy enough to manage how this could be good, but so do shysters. For fine art photographers who typically sell editions of a few dozen spectacular wildlife image, this may be of interest. However, most of their buyers want dramatic large size prints. Maybe throwing in an NFT adds a little something that makes it, or at least makes it seem more valuable. And maybe it's my terrible artistic judgment. But when I look at the images being sold as NFTs, or anything that's being sold as an NFT, artistic merit is not necessarily the criteria that adds value. The value is primarily novelty, along with a heightened level of interest and the sense that money can be made. It has many of the characteristics of the classic pyramid multi-level marketing Ponzi schemes. P.T. Barnum was right. Then, as several recent documentaries have clearly illustrated, the art world is full of shady scoundrels, larcenous thieves, and mostly bankrupt con men, taking advantage of guileless neophytes. And why would you buy an NFT when I have a few Vermeers recently discovered in von Mechern's attic for sale? Please contact me at the email address below, but act now. Prices have to go up at midnight. Or just wait a minute while I NFT them. Well, all right. I've had my fun. Over to you. Civil comments, relevant questions, please. And then... If I can get up my nerve, I'm going to create and sell an NFT. Stay tuned. Stay safe.